Welcome to The Buzz, I'm Christopher Conover. Schools are back in session around Southern Arizona, so we're talking to educators about the upcoming academic year. As schools have been preparing to reopen, the gorilla in the room has been security preparations in the wake of the school shootings in Uvalde, Texas, and elsewhere. The Sunnyside School District has made it a top priority, auditing the district's processes and physical plant to make sure it is as difficult as possible for any kind of active shooter event in any of its schools. But as Duncan Moon reports, as important as the focus on tangible things like fences, gates, cameras, and locks are, Sunnyside is building on its relationship and transparent communication within the community as its most effective preventive measure. The murders in Uvalde, Texas, sparked broad fear and concern among parents and students across the country and put school officials on heightened alert. In Tucson Sunnyside schools, the new district superintendent, Jose Costellum, called a town hall over the summer break to foster open discussion with all members of his community. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for being here. It's important to us that you're here with us, joining us in this effort. You know, we know how important it is that this is a community effort, right? It's a shared responsibility. And so we definitely want to instill this sense of comfort. And the way we do that is by being transparent about what we're doing. He said clarity across the Sunnyside community would help make sure everyone is alert to any possible warning signs. Too many times have we heard when these tragic events occur that there was red flags everywhere, right? In social media, um, with behavior, with some of the actions. And so we want to make sure that those things are prevented. And so we all have to own this. We are responsible for your children. And something that people don't like to hear is we have to eliminate human error, right? I mean, there, there are some pieces where human error can be eliminated and that's going to take training individuals. That's going to take having conversations. The communication is extremely important between our school district, our community, and, and the agencies that we work with. Sunnyside's Director of Security, Ryan Powell, carried that theme forward. He said Sunnyside's physical defenses are fairly strong. All schools have wrought iron fences with fortified lobbies and 650 surveillance cameras tied directly to law enforcement. He said the district has good protocols and he doesn't need new technology. But communication, training, and awareness among staff is key. It's only up to us. We really have to stay consistent. It's our own complacency that's going to prevent us from doing things. You know, the threat assessment is the big thing. It's finding those red flags and investigating those early. Are we complacent with them? Sometimes we are. Sometimes we look at them and we jump way ahead of the assessment. We're like, oh, that's not viable. That's a good kid. He's got good parents instead of going through the system every single time. So yeah, I believe that this is one of our weaknesses. We haven't been thorough on every single threat assessment. And we will be now. We will. So if we do see something, we say something about it. We let somebody know. Trust is essential to this kind of transparency. If you don't trust the system, if you don't trust your leaders, you won't speak up. One of the most difficult trust issues across the country is tied to law enforcement in the schools. Many parents worry they're only there to round up so-called troublemakers and arrest them. Sunnyside has three TPD officers in the district and one Security Resource Officer, or SRO, from the Pima County Sheriff's Department. We are not in the business of arresting kids. We're there to help resolve problems and create solutions. That's TPD Captain Mickey Peterson. He says they have a strong desire to build trust in the Sunnyside District. He says to do that, they strive to hire locally, using officers who live in the district and, in many cases, graduated from Sunnyside. He says having that sense of belonging to the community, what he calls a sense of ownership, is vital to building trust. It's all about building relationships, and he says they have built some strong ones at Sunnyside. I just want to share one case where we had a 13-year-old Sunnyside student who was barricaded and armed in, in an apartment. This is a very dangerous situation. It could have gone a lot of bad directions. When we got there, and we said, where does he go to school? And they said, well, he's, he's a Sunnyside student. I said, okay, we called one of the officers, and that officer knew this student, had talked to him, 
knew what he responded to, knew how to communicate with him, and by putting that officer up front and pulling back the other officers, she was able to talk him out. He put the weapon down and just came out and gave her a hug, and we solved that crisis and we got him to the professionals that could really help him. That connection that we developed through our engagement with Sunnyside High School is what brought us to a peaceful solution in that case. But in order for that type of success, stakeholders across the community, the school district, law enforcement, parents, and students, need to be able to recognize when something is wrong and when they need to raise that red flag. School counselors, county services, and nonprofit organizations work to educate the community on what to look for and how to respond. There's a shortage of trained professionals, so it's a big job and there's a long way to go. But there is a clear recognition of how important it is to achieve, and progress is being made with groups like AWARE and Liberty Partnership Kino Neighborhoods Coalition, LPKNC, taking leading roles in providing both mental health services and education. LPKNC CEO Jamal Givens says Sunnyside's tight-knit community is doing better than most and that the relationships and understanding between law enforcement and mental health providers have grown dramatically over the last five years. But he says negative attitudes about mental health need to be addressed more effectively. We need to do that as a community. And that also means that we have to destigmatize within our community and people of color, predominantly Hispanic, Latinx, Black, Native Americans, that we have to stop looking at it as though it's negative mental health, that people are local, you know, they're crazy, you know, they can't get help. We got to talk about it in order for people to get help so we don't get to instances where folks end up pulling triggers. All of the stakeholders at the town hall agreed they were not in search of a destination, that success would be a continuing process built on an intentional and flexible commitment to learning, communication, and transparency going forward. For The Buzz, I'm Duncan Moon. Margaret Cheney is the head of the local teachers union, the Tucson Education Association. She's also been teaching high school in the Tucson area for almost 30 years. When we met, she said she was cautiously optimistic about the coming school year. First of all, it's a new year, so you know, you get to start over and that's great. Um, the other thing is that, of course, we can't control certain things. So we can't control Mother Nature, uh, whether it be flooding in the streets and the buses can't get through to, you know, the dreaded C word. Um, <laughs> and so, um, but it's it's one of those things that, that now that we've kind of been through the fire, so to speak, um, we know what works and what doesn't work. So there's certain things we can't we can't uh, prevent or can't uh, change, but um, we can be prepared. And I think uh, because we have returning teachers mingling with our our new teachers, uh, they will act as mentors certainly through TEA. It's going to be a fun year, I think. I think it's going to be exciting, and I just hope the river don't rise. The last couple of years have been really tough with. The C word, COVID, as, as you mentioned, and there have been funding issues. Oh, yes. There's always funding issues. There really are. How much concern do teachers have, or can they really, okay, maybe the COVID they can't block out as much, but how much of the noise can they block out and just focus on that group of kids who hopefully are also excited, <laughs> cautiously optimistic on those first days? I don't know that it's possible to block it all out anymore. I know that there was a time when, as a teacher, it was fine to just do your thing in your classroom and, you know, shut the world out and take care of your kids, teach the curriculum, uh, make sure the relationships are good, talk to parents, that sort of thing, and, and the world was fine. Unfortunately, we have a state legislature that is not terribly friendly to public education. And so they have done everything in their power to take funding away, which means that we don't always have enough money to hire enough teachers, which overcrowds the classrooms that we have. We don't have enough funding for bus drivers. We don't have enough funding for special education, which is a huge, huge nationwide problem. We are fighting every year over vouchers 
and how they're utilized and whether or not it is uh, it, in the best interest of the Arizona taxpayer to uh, pay for private education when public education is not properly funded. If public education were properly funded, then, well, maybe, you know, I, I could kind of see that argument. But if the public schools aren't funded properly, then I don't know why my tax dollars, for instance, should go toward uh, private schools. You mentioned the teacher shortage. We've been hearing about it for a while, but it seems to be getting worse, at least what we're hearing. Is there anything from a teacher's perspective that can be done to get those open positions, especially in STEM, as you mentioned, and special education, to get those positions filled? I think the the biggest problem with the teacher shortage in Arizona is that it is unique to Arizona. I mean, there's a shortage across the nation, but in Arizona, we have people going to the U of A and, and uh, other universities to get their education degrees, but they're leaving Arizona. And the reason that they're leaving is because they're not getting paid enough. And then we have senior teachers who just aren't getting paid enough. And they look at where beginning teachers start and where they're at 15, 20 years later, and there's not a whole lot of difference. And so why not go to Massachusetts or California or Nevada, New Mexico? New Mexico just got a $10,000 raise. It's partly the, the salary, but it's also the funding of the schools and, and whether or not you'll have all the resources that you need. Are there going to be enough teachers so that you're not teaching a sixth class out of your day, have no planning period to uh, properly create uh, lesson plans and and deal with the day-to-day uh, issues that kids have. When you look at that as a new teacher or a teacher thinking about coming to Arizona, okay, I, I know that those are all the expectations of being a teacher. Do I want that and more or do I want time for myself and my family? And I think with the, the shutdown and everything that, that occurred, people are starting to realize, you know, life is short. And so if I'm going to live this life and I'm going to show and demonstrate to young people what life should be, I have to um, model it. And if I'm at my desk 24 seven, I don't want them to be like, that's ridiculous. I don't want to give them homework until they're, you know, up until midnight. It's just that kind of mentality is crazy. And so it's really important to have that balance. To deal with the shortage, Arizona and other states have changed the requirements to teach. You used to have to go to the university and get a degree in education. That's what you did. You're nodding. Some people know that's what I did long ago and far away uh, before I got into news. Those requirements are being changed. Does that help, actually? Because... You, you do get bodies in and people with some expertise, but does it really help in the end? I think that's like throwing pasta on the wall and you just sort of see what sticks. There are people that believe that anyone can teach, that, that teaching is the last resort. And to me, it is it really is a craft. It's not something that you do simply because you don't have anything else to do, because you're taking care of other human beings. It's not a business, it's not a game although it's certainly been treated like one. It is It is so important because every day that you're with those kids, you know, they remember you're the adult in the classroom and, and you're the professional. And so if you make a mistake, and you're bound to make mistakes, but if you make a mistake as a professional and you've been through training and so forth, you also know who to go to to fix it or how to fix it yourself. If you make a mistake as a 18 year old, no offense to 18 year olds, who has never had any other sort of job, that can really, really, really backfire. Parents will be upset. Kids will be upset. Your colleagues will be upset. Uh, Sometimes it will create a real rift in a school. And so I think that while it seemed on paper like a great idea to say, okay, hey, come one, come all, you know, let's let's see what happens. We're, We're playing a game with people's lives, with their future. And so if I come in and I don't have any experience, but I want to teach kids to read, but I don't know how to teach them to read, 
then they go to the next grade level without knowing how to read. And that's not right. That's incredibly wrong um, and, and unethical. You mentioned something earlier, and it, it's, it's very true. We all remember our teachers. It, ask anybody, and they might not remember every teacher, but there are always teachers. When you walked in here, our producer, Zach Ziegler, you were his freshman high school world history teacher. <laughs> he remembered you. You remembered him, possibly from all the time in detention. Yeah. I don't know, but <laughs> would you still recommend to young people who might come to you for advice, would you still recommend that somebody go into teaching? I absolutely would, but the, the thing that I would absolutely insist on is that they determine whether or not they like children. That is huge. Um, if you don't find that you're comfortable around whatever age group that you want to teach, then you should not be in that classroom because you will burn out and the kids will feel it and they will burn out and that's so unfair. When I was growing up and uh, going to college, I didn't want to teach. That was the last thing I wanted to do. But I didn't know anything about it. I just thought, it's so boring. You're behind a desk and you're grading papers all the time. And eh, they talk forever. Um, <laughs> and while all of that is true, um, it is also those relationships that I didn't see um, when I was growing up that, that uh, teachers can develop. And I had a couple of teachers that really influenced me, but, it, but not to the point where I thought, oh, I want to be like them. I didn't realize that until I was um, in Seattle and I was working at a daycare center and I realized I really like kids, but I didn't want the responsibility of little kids. And so I thought, oh, high school. And then later on, I realized, boy, I still have a lot of responsibility with high school students. And so I liked being around them. They were fun. They were silly. Um, they have all kinds of troubles and issues. Um, they get angry, they get mad, and, and can sometimes get violent. Um, but in the end, the day is worth it. That was Margaret Cheney, a local teacher with decades in the classroom and head of the Tucson Education Association. You're listening to The Buzz. I'm Christopher Conover. We're heading back to school this week, examining what's going on in education around southern Arizona. Dr. Gabriel Trujillo has been the superintendent of the Tucson Unified School District for more than five years. We talked as the first week in TUSD was underway, and I started by asking how those early days were going. Well, this has been probably one of the smoothest starts to the school year in recent memory. Obviously, the last two years have been incredibly tumultuous uh, in terms of navigating the pandemic and which families are going to be online and which families are going to be on campus and who's got a vaccine and who doesn't, fights about masks. And this is the first year that it feels like normal, like we are back. And it was such a wonderful feeling the first day of school. I had an opportunity to visit four schools on the first day and three more on the second. And to see the excitement, the electricity in the air, full classrooms, uh, teachers back doing their thing in person. We had a very, very smooth opening across the district. The district is up substantially in terms of enrollment compared to where we landed the 40th day of the school year. So that's very positive news for the school district. We implemented a new, more user friendly, uh, transportation system to deliver services to eligible students than we were able to a year ago. So we've had a year to kind of figure our way around the bus driver shortage to still deal with it, but to at least put together a more family-friendly and accessible uh, transportation option. You mentioned that enrollment is up compared to the 40th day last year. Is that just the result of COVID being less of a concern or maybe not less of a concern, we've all gotten used to where we live now with this? I think we've, we're starting to see that COVID is, is, I think, a little less of a concern with the families and students coming in, sort of this acceptance that it's now an endemic versus a pandemic and that kids are inevitably going to get it. I also think that we're seeing a lot of families come back to us from charters and from homeschool environments that they probably have sat the last two years out 
They probably have been out for a while waiting for the district to sort of fully reopen for in-person learning, and they're starting to trickle back to us. So I think that that's a really, really good thing. Enrollment has more substantially increased at our high schools, which also is a very, very positive indicator. And the bulk of the enrollment that's coming back into our high schools, they seem to be coming from charters. Of course, enrollment, we've got to watch it on a day-by-day basis. And uh, the big day for us is going to be day 10. That's where we go in and we assess all of the students that have not shown up for the first 10 days of school. And then we would have to officially withdraw them from the district, at which case day 11 and 12, we get a more true read on how substantial the increase is. You talk about uh, increases in students but we know there's a staffing shortage, so especially for math and special ed. How's the district coping with those? Well, it's a bittersweet moment because though it's always wonderful to be up with student enrollment and to have an increased demand for our instructional services, the other end of that is you have to increase your staffing, and that hasn't gone so well for us. Uh, this is the first time in several years uh, that we're carrying forward a number of teacher vacancies at the start of the school year that are more pronounced. It has been most pronounced in the areas of special education and math. And what we're doing to deal with it is, number one, we've had to rely on contracted vendors, which is, is, it's been a little bit eye-opening because what you see with contracted vendors, you start to see where the teachers have left. Okay, you start to see, for example, when you work with a uh, temp agency for certificated teachers and you see highly qualified special education practitioners coming in, they've just opted to work in the private sector as a contractor. So you start to see what happens when you pay teachers well. And a lot of these teachers that we're bringing in through these contracted vendors, they're making 70 or $80,000 a year. And when they're coming into TUSD and we say, did you like your experience in the classroom? Would you be interested in leaving the contracted vendor? The answer is no, because you guys can't afford us. And so that's, I think for me, it's been eye-opening to see that. Probably the the most strain that we put on the system to deal with vacancies is internal coverage, where we'll take vacant classes and we'll assign them out to existing TUSD teachers And though they make additional compensation, a lot of times they're working during their prep period, the hour they get to prepare lesson plans and do grading, and that puts a strain on our system as well. Let's talk about something, of course, that nobody wants to talk about, but the incident in Uvalde brought it back to the forefront, and that is security on campus. I know there's more security staff now, the the police department, if you will, for TUSD has been bumped up. How are things going with that? One of the things that I'm most proudest uh, of the Tucson Unified School District, not just our administration, but our governing board and our community, we recognize that our job is not to insert ourselves in the national debate over gun control or gun control legislation or to take stands on either side of the issue, but to really focus on the aspects of this crisis that we can control with regard to securing the safety of students and staff. Better and stronger investment in safety and security infrastructure and training, training, training. One of the things that we know from Uvalde, from Sandy Hook, and from Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, it's the actions of the individual employees inside of the building that's under attack that's going to save lives. Even more so, than the rapid response of law enforcement authorities, even more so than the leadership at the principal or administrative level inside of the building calling for the lockdowns. It's those teachers and support staff members on the ground that are at the point of the attack. How well are they prepared and trained and confident? Our governing board has invested uh, in the expansion of our school safety department to add five additional officers who really their sole mission Uh, day-to-day is going to be the professional development and training of staff. And then the second part of our initiative, as I stated, is a strong look at the current state of our safety infrastructure around Tucson Unified. We have a number of schools that we know need better fencing, better gating, better walls. We know that there are some schools with some dilapidated doors and locks that aren't working. 
We know that there are schools that still lack video surveillance systems. And I'm not saying that these measures are going to stop an intruder. If an intruder truly wants to get into a school, they're going to find a way. But a school that doesn't have an exterior fence is going to allow that intruder in that much faster than if there was uh, a more security-minded fence or wall in front of said intruder. So we will be coming forward to the governing board with a package of schools that we consider to be priority areas for these types of investments in the next six to eight weeks. For the first time in a long time, TUSD is not being watched over by the federal government relating to the desegregation order. Is that going to lead to any changes this school year? Not this school year. Uh, it, this is a tremendous victory for the Tucson Unified Community, this governing board, and our administration. When our administration took office uh, in the fall of 17, they were very, very dark days. The proverbial light at the end of the tunnel looked to be eons and eons away. We had magnet schools that had been stripped of their status. All the momentum appeared to be with the plaintiffs in terms of us remaining under court supervision in perpetuity. And in the, in the last five years, we have shown through innovation of programming, uh, renewed commitment to the unitary status plan, dramatic expansions uh, in terms of career and technical education options for kids, advanced learning experiences and AP course opportunities, access to culturally relevant curriculum, expansion of multicultural curriculum, and a dramatic expansion of the arts across TUSD. Not only have we shown a willingness to comply with the unitary status plan, but to go above and beyond to the extent that the recent order lauded TUSD uh, for these efforts and officially declared us free of, of court supervision. We plan to continue on this year. There's not going to be any major changes, but I can let the public know and all of those supporters of TUSD that for school year 23-24, we're going to start to revise. We're going to start to revisit all the different ways that we spend desegregation funds to make sure that the greatest amount of desegregation funds that we collect from our taxpayers goes directly into the classroom. All right. So before the bell for the next period rings, that we should probably wrap this up. Thanks for uh, spending some time with us. No, thank you. It's always a pleasure. And I'm not just a guest. I'm a regular listener of The Buzz. So I'm looking forward to uh, Friday. That was Tucson Unified School District Superintendent Dr. Gabriel Trujillo. And that's The Buzz for this week. Next week, we'll look at how the successor to NAFTA, the U.S.-Mexico-Canada Agreement, or USMCA, has affected Arizona's import-export industry. You can find all our episodes online at azpm.org and subscribe to our show wherever you get your podcasts. Just search for The Buzz Arizona. We're also on the NPR One app. Zach Ziegler is our producer, Jim Blackwood is our production engineer, and our music is by Enter the Haggis. I'm Christopher Conover. Thanks for listening. Arizona Public Media's original programming is made possible in part by the Community Service Grant from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting.